it's Platt, and today we head to Michigan to celebrate Oktoberfest. That's next to Platt's Beer of the Week. So the uh, particular beer we have today uh, is another Oktoberfest beer. It comes to us from the fine folks at Bell's Brewing. Uh, we've tried a beer from Bell's before. It, we had the Lager of the Lake. Um, I believe we reviewed that about a year or so ago. Uh, real quick, a little background into Bell's. Uh, Bell's is located in Comstock, Michigan, and was founded in 1983 by a gentleman named Larry Bell. At the time, it was referred to as Kalamazoo Brewing. Now, it wasn't an actual brewing brewery. It was an actual home brew shop. Um, again, in 1983, though, that was well ahead of the game. Uh, home brewing had just been legalized in 79, so it was probably one of the first home brewing shops in Michigan, and I dare say probably in the Midwest at the time. Uh, did not take Larry long, though, to get the bug and decide he wanted to brew and sell his own beer, and that's what he started doing in 1985. Um, he started selling beer. I don't know if they let him brew, brew in the shop and sell it out of the shop, or he had to, you know, buy the spot next door. Zoning was probably a little different uh, back then. That uh, first year, he uh, produced 135 barrels of beer. And what makes that real impressive was that he used a 15-gallon soup kettle as his, uh, as his brew house, basically. Uh, for those of you that homebrew, you know that's really a 10-gallon batch. If you use a 15-gallon kettle, that's a 10-gallon batch. A barrel of beer is 31 gallons. Uh, Mr. Bill spent a lot of time brewing <laughs> that year. Good for, uh, good for him. Uh, fortunately for him, again, he was kind of ahead of the game. He was one of the early... You know, homebrew shop owners, craft brewers, really started to slowly grind and build the name. Eventually, craft brewing became popular and uh, gained enough traction where by 1993, he decided to open a brew pub, something called the Eccentric Cafe, which is still open today there in Kalamazoo. Uh, the brew pub's a great way to get your beer directly to the public. Also, get to interact with the public, get their feedback. That only helps you as a brewer. Uh, and that kind of helped him keep going uh, on to the next phase of uh, the company, which was in 2003, where he decided to open a production facility in Comstock, where they are based out of today. Uh, once you get that production facility, then you start doing things like bottling and canning and getting distribution. And again, that just helps you take uh, another step forward. In 2006, Larry decided to switch the name of the company from Kalamazoo Brewing to Bell's Brewing, uh, kind of bringing the, the family name into it, uh, and family is involved in the process. Um, and family was important enough for Larry that he kind of did something that's a little different, uh, a little different trend. We've talked about some of the other breweries that once they kind of got big enough, they sold out to a major conglomerate. Again, nothing wrong with that. Those guys worked hard. They, they deserved it. But Larry went the other direction. In 2012, bought out his other investors, and now is a completely family-owned business. Now, I don't know if the children or grandchildren or what errors he's got going on, but it's a completely family-owned business, and that's kind of a real cool story to hear uh, that luckily not everyone <laughs> has sold out at this point. Uh, real quick, let's review some of their other beers. Uh, first is Kalamazoo Stout. It's a 6% ABV stout. Uh, something I uh, caught my eye on the label said it was made with brewer's licorice. Now, I'd never heard that term before, but doing a little quick research, uh, one of the tricks of the trade is to kind of spice up a beer. When I say spice, I'm not talking about like a peppery heat, but more like just to give it a kick, you know, kind of add a little different twang to it or something. Uh, brewers will use fennel or anise, which are major components, you know, in getting that licorice taste. Uh, so apparently there's a liquid or concentrate called brewer's lic licorice that they use to achieve that. So I found that very interesting and, and slightly educational. Uh, next is something called rind over matter, uh, kind of a play on the term uh, mind over matter. It is a 5% ABV uh, wheat ale made with lemon and orange zest uh, those citrus notes really work well with wheat beers. And again, I just kind of like the name. Speaking of names, this next one is a pretty solid name that some of you may or may not get. Uh, it's called, uh, this one goes to 11 Ale. It is a 11% ABV 
uh, Imperial Red IPA made with 11 different malts and 11 different hops. Now, where does the 11 come from? Well, if you're old enough, you might remember the movie Spinal Tap. And uh, the band wanted to show that they really love to crank it up and really love to party. So all their amps, instead of going to 10, went to 11. Uh, one of the funnier scenes in uh, movie history, if you get a chance, check out that movie. Lastly, uh, the last beer is Hop Slam. This is a 10% ABV double IPA uh, made with honey. That That's kind of a something, again, I just haven't noticed in too many uh, your big IPAs, but the note of honey, I always like the addition of honey in a lot of beers. I think it really adds a unique flavor. It's a unique fermentable. Uh, Hop Slam also does, or they do something with Hop Slam that's kind of unique too. They sell Hop Slam in the five liter mini cakes. And I've, I've done a review before with Warsteiner. Most of the beers that they do that are more, you know, lagers, uh, more session style beers. Uh, this is generally something, you know, if you're buying a five liter mini cake, it's something you and the boys are splitting. And it, more of what I call chugging style beers. At 10%, that is not a chugging style beer for sure. Well, before we try this particular beer though, let's check out the stats. Well, since we're in the Oktoberfest mood, I thought today I would talk about Beer Steins. Uh, if you think Oktoberfest, especially the classic German Oktoberfest, you think of people with these giant steins, or, well, there's really two types of steins. There's these, these ceramic beer mugs like this, and then there's the classic ones that have kind of the lead that you could, you know, use with your thumb. Uh, real quick, a little bit about, again, the origins. The term beer stein or stein is an English term for uh, a a beer mug or yeah I guess a beer mug because it has a handle beer mug made of stoneware so it's not glass uh, some are made from wood some are made of pewter some are ceramic um, just not glass um, again the technology of perfecting glass did not you know just in in the history of time is kind of a recent invention uh, the term was first used uh, in literary in England around 1855. Here in the U.S. it was first used in a Vogue article in 1894. Um, now, beer steins have been around a lot longer, and even the, the term has been around longer. There's an old English term called stein. Hopefully I'm saying that right. S-T-A-E-N-E -E, that, uh, that was, meant pitcher or jug. So you can kind of see how the word kind of progressed over the years. Um, the ones with the lids on, there, there's an interesting hypothesis. I'm not going to say this is true or not, but a lot of people think that lid was added on around the time of the Black Plague. People are afraid of whatever's in the air, and God forbid we don't want it in our beer. Uh, we all kind of understand that right now. Uh, most likely, though, that was just put on to keep bugs or different things or somebody throwing something in your beer. You know, you're eating. You know, you don't want your food in your beer. Most likely, that was the reason that... Uh, was created, but I, I found that as an interesting story. Now, getting back to the use of steins and then switching over to glass, uh, for years and years and years, these classic steins, this stein actually came from uh, the Munich Oktoberfest, uh, I believe 1986, from uh, the Oktoberfest 1986, where this uh, stein came from. Uh, Again, they traditionally used these, but by the late 1800s, more specifically 1892, the the people that ran the uh, ran the Oktoberfest over there switched to glass. Glass at that point had kind of got standardized production. Uh, you got a quality product, and more importantly, it's more sanitary. Uh, you weren't worried about scratching as much or chipping uh, as you do with this uh, stoneware. Uh, last little note, which I find really interesting, is the world's largest manufacturer of beer steins is a company called Sura Marte, and it's based in Brazil. So uh, next time you're, uh, doesn't say here where it's made, but uh, next time you're looking for beer steins, there's a decent chance it's actually from Brazil. Well, enough about beer steins. Let's actually drink some beer. I am 
going to say this is just a slight bit darker of a copper than um, than the 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 uh, Marzen we had from Firestone Walker. Um, a little softer nose. You still get those malt notes, but it's a little softer. Let's give her a try. That is a little more mellow. There's malt there. Um, you don't get, though, some of the toffee toasted bread. No, you know, um, it's a little softer. Um, you know, instead of like a darker toast, or it's more like a biscuit, if that, <laughs> that kind of makes any sense uh, of the style of the malt. This also has a little shorter finish than that one we tried with Firestone Walker. Still a very drinkable beer, still plenty of malt. Um, you get, you don't get any hop, yeah, there's no real hop aroma. Um, there's no hop bitterness, but it's, it's balanced. And I, and I use that term a lot because you don't necessarily have to taste the hops to know it's there providing balance. And uh, I, I think that's kind of what we got here. Overall, decent beer, a, a nice, easy drinker. Uh, I'm not going to say this is the greatest Mars I've ever had, but a nice, solid beer, uh, well representative of the style. Well, I hope you liked this video. If you did, please subscribe down below. Also, please like the video because it lets YouTube know we're putting out good content. If you have any questions, comments, concerns, or beers that you would like me to try, please leave them in the comment section, or you can always contact me on the Twitter page. Well, until next time, bottoms up.